Right, Meg Slaymaker, very good to see you again. Now, last time we spoke about what would happen if I or anyone, for that matter, were to join the Jehovah's Witnesses. What would happen? What would the sequence of events be? And you told us about the initial love bombing and then the expectations to uh, to attend all the meetings and what would happen if you fell away a bit. And we're going to go a bit deeper into that now. And you've been to this fellowship yourself, so you know firsthand what this is about. Um, what would happen? if you did something wrong, something that was considered a sin, and then were called into a meeting, uh, otherwise known as a disciplinary meeting? So if you were called in for a uh, judicial committee, which is the three men, uh, three elders who will decide your fate within the, the organization, basically they'll you know ask to meet at a specific time at the kingdom hall. And then, uh, if you accept their invitation, you show up, sit down, and uh, answer whatever questions they have, and then they um, deliberate, and you have to wait outside the room while they do that. If you're an indoctrinated witness, then <clears throat> you'll kind of think they're praying to uh, Jehovah about this, and you'll kind of think that um, they'll do what's best for you, but really what they do as soon as you leave the room is they pull out their shepherd the flock of god book that they have to keep hidden from the rank and file they'll pull that out and they'll start trying to uh look over it to see what it says about whether or not what they should do in your case so they'll uh look over <clears throat> some of the chapters that talk about um uh, whether or not to disfellowship or um and, and they might try to decide what to do um, in your particular case based on mm. how you presented yourself in the interview and based on what their book tells them to do. So it's not even them talking to each other about, oh, how they feel about you, and but they're trying to decide your repentance based on a pre-written book by people that were generalizing um, what somebody might do when they come into one of these judicial committees and they're just judging all of the actions and every little word you said based on what this book says. And that's how they will make their decision about your fate. <laughs> and am I right in saying that uh, usually these three elders are, or always th these three elders are three men and they might have a young woman on her own in this meeting for hours. And it could be, depending on the sin, it could be, over a sexual matter, over an intimate matter. Oh, yeah. And they'll ask you really personal questions, too. And uh, questions that are really inappropriate to, to just ask someone anyway. But especially in the situation where there's three men and you're by yourself as a woman and you're just answering these really uh, inappropriate questions. It's very, uh, very weird. And yet, as a witness, if you are sufficiently indoctrinated, you kind of just don't realize how crazy it all is at the time. And uh, maybe afterwards you do, but at the time, most most witnesses don't even realize how weird it is to be uh, asked these questions. I remember hearing uh, from one uh, young lady who appeared on another podcast, and she said that uh, she had committed some sort of sexual indiscretion i don't know what that was but uh her meeting with the three elders was six hours of them asking her you know where did you put your hand where did he put his hand and it just seemed like the guys were you know <laughs> getting thought material for later you know what i mean yeah yeah oh yeah it's totally it's totally weird and in my case like i've like you mentioned before i got this fellowship so in my case, I don't think the elders that were dealing with me were um, trying to, I mean, they did ask too personal of questions and I can say that for sure. But 
I don't think they were doing it out of enjoyment because they seemed uncomfortable. They seemed fidgety. You know, it seemed awkward for them as it was for me. I think they were just doing what their shepherd, the flock of God book asked them to do because they're trying to get enough details so that they can make a judgment on your fate. So if they uh, don't get enough details out of you or they don't see um, if, if you're not willing to answer their questions or if you don't present yourself in a way that shows that you uh, are repentant according to their book, then they will disfellowship you. So if somebody is like, do you have to know that? Like, why do you have to know that? Or if somebody's like, oh, I don't know, uh, I don't remember, and they're trying to like avoid getting into all of these details, they will take that as a sign that you're not repentant. <laughs> And if you are determined not to be re repentant, does that mean you're you're out in the street right away, or what happens next? If you go in there and you, you know, like let's say you're going in there because of apostasy, okay? So maybe there was some rumor that you you don't believe in a teaching that you're required to believe in. So if you go in there just because of that and let's say you don't believe the whole thing anymore and you think it's all a sham so you're determined just to go in there to try to argue with them for example maybe not argue but to try to like state your case they're not going to listen to anything you have to say and uh they will just be like oh we don't want to argue or we can go back and forth all day or mm, you know let's just get to the point and they keep cutting off any conversation they will, I've heard so many of these judicial committees because they've been recorded and put online and they will not listen to anyone who has any kind of argument about why the religion is false. They just keep, you know, let's, you know, let's get back to the point. Did you or did you not say this to brother or sister so-and-so or blah, blah, blah. And then as soon as they get out of you enough information to, uh, for them to be able to say that, yep, you don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore, then yeah, you're pretty much just kicked out right away and uh they'll make an announcement at the following meeting that you're no longer a jehovah's witness and then everybody will shun you <laughs> right so the shunning can happens obviously after afterwards uh why would you keep coming to the meetings or would you well it depends on the situation again if you were someone who was disfellowshipped because of some wrongdoing and you still believe that it's the truth you might try to um in your head um, understand why you got to fellowship and you might try to you know humble yourself and uh, accept the discipline and keep going to the meetings and every time you go to the meeting you'll sit at the back of the kingdom hall you don't have to sit at the back of the kingdom hall but most people do because most disfellowship people don't like to draw attention to themselves because it's awkward walking into a room with everyone who was your former peers and they don't even look at you anymore or if they do look at you if you catch their eye they quickly look away as if they don't even want to make eye contact with you because you're so disgusting so it's awkward to be in that situation so usually when you walk in you sit at the back so as to try to avoid as much people seeing you as possible and uh, you try to appear invisible but you it know that so they're... bizarre to me because of course i grew up in a, in a baptist church and if anything like that happened it would be, it would just seem I mean, like I say, uh, if, if you're if you're on the outside, you could see it. If you're on the inside, you, you can't see it. Yeah, no, you don't really realize how crazy it is until uh, until it happens. Because even like in my case, I went along with all the disfellowshipping rules. If uh, throughout the years, anybody that got disfellowshipped to my congregation, I obviously followed the rules and I didn't talk to them. But I didn't realize how dehumanizing it was until I was the one in that position. <laughs> yeah. So if you were to be kicked out, let's say, excommunicated, I don't think they use that term. But how would that happen? Is that just a, a natural result of disfellowshipping? Or do they expect you to keep trying and to keep going to disciplinary meetings to, to be repentant and come back? Or is there a case where you are out the door? You can also be disassociated. So if you're somebody who's a baptized Jehovah's Witness and you no longer want to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore, you can meet with the elders, same kind of thing, it's a judicial meeting, and 
you would just say, I no longer want to be a Jehovah's Witness. And you don't even have to meet with them. You could just write a letter to them saying you don't want to be known as a Jehovah's Witness anymore. And then they would, at the next meeting, make the same kind of announcement that they would make as if you were being disciplined. So the, the announcement that they make, whether you're disfellowshipped or disassociated, uh, sounds like this. Uh, So-and-so is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So that's the announcement they make. So if you're just sitting in the audience and you hear them talk about, say, somebody's first and last name and then say, are no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you could, you don't know whether or not they've been disfellowshipped or they've chosen to leave on their own accord. You don't know. Mm. So you just treat them like they're disfellowshipped and you just shun them. That happens in the apostasy movie, doesn't it? Because the older sister gets disfellowshipped and they just say, so-and-so is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. It does. Yeah, that's what happens to her. She was a fellowship. And for anyone who wants to listen to one of these secret recordings, I've got one on my channel. I'll put a link below. This was uh, sent to me by, by Sam Powell. And this is a disfellowshipping, uh, or rather a disciplinary meeting that she had as she sec secretly recorded it on her phone. And it's really fascinating. And you can hear everything that goes on in that room. And uh, so I'll, I will have that available. And uh, afterwards, Meg, after all this happened to you, it, it wasn't just over. Your family members, certain family members shunned you, which meant they they just pretend that you're not there. They won't talk to you. They won't look at you. They certainly won't interact with you. And uh, this still goes on today, doesn't it? Years later. How many years has it been? When I got disfellowshipped, that was in, I think it was like eight years ago now, probably eight or between eight and nine, probably eight years ago. So when I got this fellowship, I uh, still believed it was the truth and I tried to come back. And I definitely developed some doubts while I was this fellowship, just through the fact that I got this fellowship when I didn't think I really should have got this fellowship. I definitely developed some doubts, but those doubts didn't, uh, you know, they weren't enough to take me out of the religion at that time. I didn't really see any other way of life. So I felt like I had to save face and I couldn't lead the organization this way. You know, I couldn't just have all of my former friends and peers think of me as this, you know, unrepentant, evil wrongdoer, you know, because that's, I knew that's how they saw me now. And I just didn't feel like that's a good way to leave. So I tried to come back and I did get back. I got reinstated. But my brother to this day, he is a ministerial servant, uh, which is a title just below the elder in a congregation. Him and his, uh, his wife and his kids are uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. So he to this day still shuns me, even though I'm technically not uh, disfellowshipped anymore. According to their... Um, you know, viewpoint, I am just uh, inactive is the word that you would use to describe me. But they still shun me. And I think the reason that he has shunned me for all those years is because in his mind, he thinks that if I was to talk to the elders and, you know, tell them about my lifestyle, that uh, they would disfellowship me. So, He's just kind of preemptively shunning me, even though I'm technically not disfellowshipped. So that, uh, that certainly doesn't, uh, I was going to say it's going to mess up things like Christmas, but Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate Christmas. I mean, I assume you do now, but uh, I mean, that must be awful. Your brother, I think it's your younger brother, you said. Um, no phone calls, no nothing. I mean, if you were in hospital, would he visit you? Correction, he is my older brother. He's older than me. If I've been in the situation where I've been in hospital since he's started his shutting of me, and no, he hasn't come to see me ever. So, um, But what did happen recently is my father and his father, uh, obviously, he fell, he was pretty ill recently. And I'm not going to explain everything that's been going on with him, but he ended up in the hospital and there was a period of time there where I kind of thought that he might die because it was quite serious. And so anyway, I uh, was called by my mom 
to get to the hospital. And uh, because, you know, they were really concerned about his condition. So when I left work that day, I happened to work, to be working really close to where he was. So I was able to be at the hospital in like a few minutes. And I was not expecting that when I got off the elevator and walked to his room that I would see my brother there. I just mm -hmm. wasn't even, I wasn't even really thinking about it. Um, so my parents are still witnesses um, and they're not in my brother's congregation, but like they're still witnesses. My brother, you know, he talks to them and everything. He's just been shunning me and my parents uh, even though they're witnesses, they don't really, uh, they somehow can separate what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be shunning me, but they can somehow, you know, put that off into a different spot in their mind and can still be Jehovah's Witnesses without shunning me. They, they don't want to shun me. And I'm grateful of that, obviously. But so I walked into here in this, you know, to his room and I wasn't really expecting to see him. But of course, I guess he also got the call that my dad was very sick. So he was also there. And uh, when I saw his, when I saw him at first, I kind of like, my heart kind of was like, oh no, <laughs> because I, I didn't have any preparation, obviously, for this. And I hadn't seen him in so long. It's like been seven years probably since he's uh, since I've seen him, and yeah. So he he walked up to me right away and he gave me a hug, and I was kind of like taken aback because I didn't know what to expect really, and uh, it was a little awkward for a few seconds. But and then later on, when my dad was a little bit like he what he was. He was really confused, I'll just say that, at the hospital, and he didn't really know any of us was even really there. So, you know, my brother was hungry and asked if we wanted anything to eat, and I was like, yeah, I mentioned I was hungry too, and he was like, well, why don't you come down to the food court with me, and we'll go get something to eat, and I was like, really not wanting to, because, because, because I knew that as soon as we got down there, that would he start would start proselytizing to you, perhaps? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I knew yeah. that it would turn to that, oh, you know, gosh. whole situation of me having to explain myself, you know, after all these years. And clearly, I mean, because like I mentioned in the previous video, witnesses don't really think that you can leave for any legitimate reason. You know, they think that if you leave, it must be because you're a sinner, or you've been stumbled. And so I knew it would come down to this conversation where I'd have to try to explain why I'm not a witness anymore and that he wouldn't understand it. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Went down there and uh, we sat down. When we sat down to eat, that's when he started like right away kind of veering towards that conversation. And the first thing he said to me was that, He's like, I just want to know because he's like, mom and dad aren't honest with me about your situation. They don't tell me the truth. He's like, I don't know why. I don't know if it's mom's doing or dad's doing. He's like, but they don't tell me, you know, the truth of situations. He's like, so I just want to know from you, you know, what is your uh, you know, are you disfellowshipped or what's going on? Like, so he was acting as if he didn't even know whether or not I was disfellowshipped. And I, I kind of feel like he does, he did know. Um, but I'm pretty sure my parents explained to him that I was disfellowshipped, but that I'm now reinstated. And that's why they were so mad at him for shutting me because in their eyes, this is a loophole, right? As long as I'm not disfellowshipped, I'm just an active he can still talk to me and, and in their eyes, he shouldn't be shutting me. Right. So, so he was saying like, okay, well, what, which is it? And so I was like, I did get disfellowshipped and then I got reinstated. And I said, technically, if you're going to go by their terms, I'm just inactive right now. And I said, I haven't been disfellowshipped since. And he's like, 
oh, okay, well, that might change things. But I know it's not going to. I know it's not going to. I think that he just felt bad for having to see me after all these years. And it was awkward for him. So he's trying to come up with some explanation, right, as to why he hasn't been talking to me. And so I was like, yeah, I was like, well, I'm not disfellowshipped right now. So, yeah, I'm technically just inactive. And he's like, so then, you know, why is it that you don't want to go back? And he tried to get me to explain. And so I knew that he wouldn't accept. I knew it wouldn't be a good idea to get into all the things wrong with the organization and that I think they're a cult and all of this, right? I just knew trying to put all of that information into him right now would just not work. And I knew that if I, because I do want to have a relationship with him, not even mainly because of him, because of my nephew and niece. <laughs> I want to be able to see them, you know, if I want to see them, right? And so I didn't want to like jump into, oh, there are cults and all of this. So I just said that I don't believe it anymore. And uh, he was like, he couldn't accept that answer. He said, you know, I don't understand how you can't, believe it and uh, if you don't believe it well then how how can you live in this world like you don't have any hope and and that's what it kind of got into for me so i thought okay well the best thing i could try to explain to him is this so i said to him okay well obviously you and i we grew up believing in god and in his case he didn't actually become a witness until he was 18 because he's quite a bit older than me and my parents didn't bring him in. He became a witness after my parents became witnesses and he kind of came in on his own. But so I said, we both grew up, you know, believing in a God. And I mean, before you became a witness, you always had like some sort of belief. And I'm like, but like, there's plenty of people in the world who grow up without any belief. And they don't think that life is just horrible and doomed. And, you know, because they don't have a belief in anything after this life, this life becomes all that much more precious <laughs> and they can make the most of it while they're here and try to make a good impact so that when they're gone, whatever they were able to do while they were here is still kind of carries on, whether that's through their kids or through something they were able to accomplish that's done some good. Right. I'm like, and I said, well, obviously not everybody, you know, is able to, give some sort of really lasting effect on society. I'm like, but the point is not everyone grows up with a belief. I'm like, so all those people, are you telling me that all those people who don't believe in paradise on earth and the witness believing, you know, the witness teachings, all those people just think life has no meaning because of that. <laughs> I'm like, if everybody thought that there's no meaning to anything, then I think we'd be in a lot worse of a situation in the world than we are. <laughs> But you have, of course, um, you've, you've survived it. Uh, you have been shunned for a long time. But uh, so there is, I guess, there is hope for people who have been in a situation like yours who perhaps uh, don't believe or come to not believe anymore and have been shunned from the JWs or from a group like it. So um, there is some encouragement. You can get people who've been in this situation, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, like, even with him, we happen to have a decent conversation. I never once said that oh, they're a cult and, you know, all of this. I just kind of tried to get him to look at things from a different perspective because when you're a witness, you kind of don't really see anything from any. You can't see anything from a different perspective. You just have this outlook that's been told to you. This is how you're supposed to think. And anything that contradicts that outlook, you just, like, don't think about it. And it was so funny because even during our conversation he actually said we try to think how he worded it i don't want to mess it up he actually said that oh when he hears things you know about people in the organization or things that have happened in the organization that are you know not good he just doesn't think about that i don't think about that i don't dwell on that because clearly you know those people are just, you know, not good people and they're not going to be in the new system and Jehovah will, will fix that. And I said to him, okay, I'm like, so 
those people are in the organization though and they're doing bad things you know like pedophiles etc i'm like but they made it to god's organization so in that case is it really god's organization or are is it just another man-made organization just like all of them that have bad people and good people in them because witnesses will admit oh there's good people in all religions they'll admit that to your face but to then to try to connect the dots like okay so there's good people and there's bad people in all religions in that if that's the case clearly god hasn't chosen one specific religion you know what i mean and it I always seems to be about that, doesn't it? It always seems to be about uh, uh, we're the chosen ones, uh, whether it be yeah. the, the Jews or the latest cult, you know. Yeah, and so I just told him, like, from everything that I've seen, I've told him, there's no way in my mind that this is God's organization. But, like, to me, this just looks like another man-made religion. Like, so I can't believe it anymore, and I just don't believe it anymore. And even though he would admit to a lot of the things I was saying, he just couldn't cross over to the logical, you know, line of reasoning that, oh yeah, it is a man-made organization. He just couldn't. <laughs> well, you never know. You might have planted a little seed in his head. Uh, we don't know. I guess it's it's a yeah. it's a case to watch this space. But I just want to thank you, Meg, for coming back for this part two, so we could uh, find out what it's like after someone's been disfellowshipped and about the shunning. Uh, this unfortunately it looks like this is going to continue in the Jehovah's Witnesses for many years to come, but that's it's part and parcel of uh, who they are, isn't it? Yeah, and I find it really ironic that this year's convention is all about love never fails. <laughs> it just seems like such a terrible title for an organization that encourages completely cutting off loved ones. And that was another thing that I did tell my brother when I was talking to him. I told him that I don't agree. He tried to explain to me that he wasn't shunning me for personal reasons. He's like, I'm not doing it to hurt you. I still think about you and I still love you and I still pray for you. I'm just doing it because, you know, I said, I know you feel like it's the right thing you're supposed to do. And I said to him, but I don't agree that it's the right thing. And I think it's horrible when I see people shunned in any religion for just choosing not to believe it anymore. And I told him that I really hope that in the future, if any of your kids don't stay in it, that you and your wife do not shun them. And I said that to him. And he was like, he didn't actually say whether or not he would or shun them. He just said that he used to worry a lot about whether or not his kids would, would stay in it. But now he tries not to worry about it. He's like, because he can't save them. He can only do the best he can. And then it's going to be left up to them what they do. And he tried to kind of avoid saying whether or not he would shun them. But I told him, I really hope whenever they make their decision that it doesn't end your relationship with them. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. Again, I just want to thank you so much, Meg, for coming on to Talk Beliefs again. And uh, no doubt we will see you again in the very near future. Thank you.